sink. It's, it's just unbelievable. They're just flooding in. People, this island's going to sink if they all keep coming. So I sometimes say I'm going to start calling myself Alice because I live in Flaming Wonderland. And that's how I feel. called aliens, witches, and bloodsuckers. One thing we do know is that they mean the civilized world harm. Aside from a few minority sympathizers, most humans are agreed aliens are not welcome here. Recent reports and eyewitness accounts from the border suggest they are dark, shadowy forms who communicate in a strange tongue, signaling to one another under the noses of would-be victims. Horrifically, it has been claimed that one of these invaders has savagely attacked the Queen's corgis. Don't panic. Don't panic. Just fear for your life. The others are coming. And something about them's not white. They'll snatch your body and your children too. They'll take your jobs and religion you. Yeah, it's catching. They say the terrorists shock. They say they have two faces. Horror. They say they control thoughts. They say they leave slimy traces. In a public opinion poll taken yesterday by Whitewash News Corp, it emerged that a staggering 89% of humans believe that there are alien invaders already living among us. Mrs. Beggins from Misery Upon Moor said, Well, I saw at least five down the Labour Exchange when I was there, sponging off the taxpayer. Whilst Mr. Punchum from Rowe exclaimed, If I get my hands on that little alien bugger who nicked my onions, I'll ring his blood. And Miss Choking Picket Fence from Horsey Manor revealed, Well, I've noticed some in the old vicarage. Well, they bring the area down. One has to fit into one's surroundings, doesn't one? Amen. The nation's media, sorry, that's leaders, have issued the following warning. Be on red alert. Report any suspicious behavior, smells, colors, sounds and movements to the proper authorities. We need you. Could your noisy neighbor be an alien? Could quiet Mrs. Miggins and her cats be invaders? Biding their time, awaiting the signal to attack. Has your postman's routine changed? Are you still living in that one-bedroom flat when that two-up, two-down across the leafy way is filled to the brim with a mysterious family and their many cousins? Have you seen strange comings and goings that could signify a dangerous threat to our society? Yes! Then stand up and be counted. Do your duty by your country and raise the alarm. But remember the words of General Obliterate. Do not approach invaders unless all. Very good. It is believed they have extensive plans to take us over, to drain our resources and set up home here, resulting in severe changes. Bye. 
delighted Now want a better life How dare Tedder, Tedder, England forever Catch the alien, burn the witch I'm not a racist, but my curtains twitch Shock, horror, no tomorrow They've scaled the borders, we're overwhelmed All plans for freedom must be shelved Red alert, lie, divert, keep the fear amongst yourselves. Blame the aliens for this living hell. Rivers of blood into hood, unemployment and high crime. An invader replaced this heart of mine. The savages roam, beam them home. They've got a collar and tie. They sweep my hotel floor. They claim we bomb their planet in a cash for mineral war. Don't you feel scared that your voice isn't heard? Doesn't it make you insecure that aliens live next door? Don't you get it? They're changing this green and pleasant land. My England, my little England, with their strange languages and rhythmic music, feeding us spicy food at our local restaurants. Their pink palms handing over money, selling you charms. It's out of control. They don't even have milk in their tea. I see them everywhere. They're suffocating me. Yellow knit curtains, exotic plants. They're an underground army, swarming like flying ants, driving public transport, dodging and ducking, mixing chemicals and cooking illegal. Slaves! They weren't meant to stay, not on my street anyway. They discredit you and me, teaching in our schools, all for free. They're taking over me, becoming me, becoming free. Don't panic, we're the club. Get out, get out, take flight, take flight, leave this place! Britain. They used to say the sun never set on the British Empire. But that was a long time ago. The sun finally set. The Second World War made the Americans a lot of money as bystanders for so long, selling weapons that we went into debt to buy, a debt only repaid in the last few years. Then things really changed. The Americans grew in wealth, buoyed by the richness of its own diversity, built on immigrants. Those who dream and design are always contributing to our ways of work. They're always one step ahead, too. TV sets, cable channels, pay-per-view. Scientists are elated at the condition of both chimp and capsule. They came through the test in a manner that brings a man flight closer to reality. For the US. We British had a few things before they did, too, though. Mad cow disease. More VCRs than anyone else and the highest concentration of CCTV cameras in the whole world. Okay, so not too much to be proud about there. But when we're even ashamed of our own flag, what's to become of us British? What does it mean to be British? This is where I grew up. South Yorkshire, right in the heart of Britain. Whilst the press were warning its people of floods of immigrants, South Yorkshire recently became famous for floods of a more serious kind when, perhaps thanks to climate change, a year's worth of rainfall actually fell within 12 hours, damaging entire neighbourhoods. But the area's communities had already been decimated in the 1980s when the Conservative government, because the coal industry was heavily unionised, closed the mass majority of coal mines, leaving thousands of miners unemployed in the process. Well, I think there were, there were two circumstances why Thatcher wanted to get rid of the coal industry. One was she feared there was an enemy within. The miners were very, very strong. They were made strong, really, because during the last great, the Second World War, we wouldn't have survived without the pits, wouldn't have survived without the miners. The country would have gone down to, to, to starvation and, and defeat. Because coal was in demand, miners were in demand and when you're in demand as a labour force you've got some strength but as soon as they started to dash for gas as they called it and started to close down the coal-fired power stations started to find alternatives to coal in, in, in diesel then the miners came under attack um, and naturally they, they defended their jobs they defended their jobs because in many of these communities around Doncaster and Sheffield that was all there was in the, in, the, in the local community, was the pit. Everyone knows that. If you close the pit, then the community falls apart. I mean, the, the community was built about 
well, it was built around those, those villages as soon as people began to move into them. I mean, even the miners themselves were, most of them were immigrants. My dad, who was Irish, came over and ended up, he, he came over in the early 50s and at that time he had to go into the, either the services for two years or into the mines and he chose to go into the mines along with many other immigrants and refugees from, the, from Eastern Europe principally. The mobility of labour, it was essential for capitalism to have that. Labour moves, capital moves. And where capital moves, labour follows. Coal and steel, they shaped the identity of our communities. They resourced our communities. They gave communities a sense of themselves. I think the whole issue of coal closures, pit closures, the eradication of mining in these parts, it, the anger and the wrath was not so much against the fact that pit by pit they were closing. It was the fact that they were closed in such a draconian manner Nothing at all was offered by way of alternative employment for the people who worked in those industries. No recognition of the great skills that were involved, the courage, the, uh, the commitment to uh, the community at large, the historical role in building the wealth of this country. People were treated like they were rubbish. And at the time, it, even though we were thrashed and we were in defeat, the sense of community and solidarity was absolutely marvellous and looking back on it, probably unprecedented and unreplicable, if there is such a word. Well, it started coming up early in the strike sort of thing because we worked on the railway, actually worked on the freight trains, so uh, like we, we used to shift coal, but obviously we didn't shift any coal for the year. And then on solidarity visits we'd sort of come up to Hatfield, Maine normally and uh, sort of one of the lads had organised like a twinning sort of thing and we'd come up here and the guys would take you out picketing and you saw the sort of the police violence and the repression at first hand and sort of just felt that's really what you should be doing. So that was, still, that was the start of it all really. When Maggie came along she, she broke the, uh, the North and she was taking the North down because she wasn't North when we should have been one. She was north and south. But when I look around and I hear people in these call centres and that, in fact I know some that they go in because needs must. And it keeps wolves from door. And then they move on. But I shouldn't imagine it'll be the same environment as what we had. First thing you notice when you come out of pit, out of mining, it isn't the same comradeship. You know, they'd all mucking together, it were in for a penny, in for a pound, whether it be work or whatever, even social side. But then when you come out of it, you're on your own. And you can't replace that spirit, I'll be honest. No. So, what makes us British? Well, British. Have our old values gone? Is this why people are leaving? It's a long road I've travelled. It's a long road I've traveled. Seems like I've traveled. In case you were wondering, this isn't South Yorkshire. This is the Spanish island of Mallorca, and now also home to many British. Whilst in 2004, 582,000 people entered Britain, 360,000 left Britain that same year, with the number of asylum seekers entering the UK, decreasing from the previous year by 33%. That's its lowest level in 16 years. But the press didn't seem to report on that much. Meanwhile, the amount of immigrants in Spain has tripled in the last 10 years. There are over three quarters of a million British people there. Ah, uh, it's quite a contribution, quite the gift. More British people are arrested or hospitalized here than in any other destination they choose. No wonder the Mallorcans welcome us with open arms. Meanwhile though, the Spanish government has tried to become stricter on asylum seekers and there have been cases of unlawful expulsion of foreign miners in contravention of Spanish law. The British we spoke to in Mallorca though, didn't even seem to be seeking asylum. I was, uh, it was a preparation to my Around the World Odyssey and I thought I'd come to Mallorca to try 
a cheap holiday on my own. And within two days, I realised that I was not going to go around the world. But I had to think of something. So I thought I'll come back to New Yorker because I liked it. <laughs> Originally, I moved here because I was dating a footballer from the football team here in Mallorca, and it didn't really work out. But I liked it so much here that I thought, well, oh, I'm going to try it out, stick it out, and stay. And I did, and got a job at a bar, and just made ends meet for the time being. And then, you know, everything kind of worked out, and I, I just really preferred the quality of living here as opposed to the US. Originally I decided to come to New York. Uh, I was working on a building site. I had no uh, no ties, split with my girlfriend of, a, of six years. Nothing tying me down. I was living with my parents and um, I thought oh, I'll do a season. A couple of my mates were coming over. Do a season in New York. Uh, I thought yeah, it sounds like, sounds like a bit of fun, you know what I mean? Yep, the British have left their little island in droves. And they haven't just been going to Spain. Almost a quarter of a million British people live in South Africa, and one and a half million now live down under, at the other side of the planet. I think probably the most uh, absurd interview I ever did, actually, um, was with these people um, who had left London because uh, they thought that uh, there were too many foreigners here. Uh, you know, the idea of, like, move, they moved to Cyprus, moving abroad because there are too many foreigners here, it's a bit bonkers. And then they say, oh, well, you know, the immigrants in London, uh, you know, they make no efforts to fit in, they don't learn the language, they stick to themselves. And there they are, living in Cyprus, they only speak English, they eat English food, they only have English friends. Uh, but absolutely no self-awareness that, you know, that they're, they're, that, uh, they're doing exactly uh, what, uh, uh, you know, they, uh, they complain so much that immigrants in London do. Back in Britain, there were still dark-skinned asylum seekers taking advantage of Britain's resources. Here in Lindholm Immigration Removal Centre. This hidden prison is where asylum seekers are held and treated like criminals as they await refugee status. There, immigrants have been guarded with wooden sticks and are often unable to find publicly funded legal advice, so face deportation without key facts in their cases even being considered. Um, I first got involved in this kind of politics because of the contact with Iraqi Kurds. So I was particularly, particularly interested, particularly shocked really about what had happened to them and their experience. So of course you'll know that one well, of the reasons given for the Iraq war was to protect the Kurds. And the Kurds arrived in Britain at seeking protection and hoping to find asylum and refuge and safety. And I worked with them in an area of Sheffield called Bone Grieve. I found out people were, hundreds of people, were literally destitute had got here to find there was no right to stay. There was no, the British government didn't believe that Iraq was a, um, an unsafe place, incredibly. Um, and people uh, were often living on the streets, uh, they were homeless, they were penniless. And it made me think about how the whole system worked, about the treatment that people got in Iraq and Kurdistan. And when they came to find refuge and asylum in Britain, had their applications turned down more often than not, I was threatened with deportation. Indeed, dozens of them had been deported back to Kurdistan. And we know for a fact that people had been killed, as we warned, when they were deported to Kurdistan. Amnesty International estimates that tens of thousands of people who have sought asylum have been detained under Britain's Immigration Act, including vulnerable people such as pregnant women, children, and victims of torture. Their detention is often unlawful. For many people who have sought asylum in the UK, languishing in detention has led to mental illness, self-harm, and even to suicide attempts. In Britain, every other day a detainee makes an attempt at taking their own lives. During his six long and agonising years of trying to seek permanent refuge in Britain, Udhay Bandari, not allowed to work legally, volunteered his time helping to recycle bicycles for disadvantaged families. At an appeal hearing in the Immigration and Appeals Tribunal building in Glasgow, he set himself on fire and died days later. Shoved me into the dining room, and that was that. 
I was standing there with like three policemen and a policewoman around me. So that I couldn't move, they wouldn't let me go and speak to me. And he said, that's where we take him and found that number and they'll be able to visit him. And when I found the number, it was Rotherham Custody Suite. And I said that I'd been told I'd be able to visit him. I would have told you that because you're not allowed to. And um, you know, just, just, they want you to shut up, you know, so you can just get on with it, just try, you know, tell him you want me. And, you know, we went to the desk and they sort of shook the phone at you and say, dial that extension number. And I said, I've, you know, you've got the one number as I've fetched him a change of price. I was caught. I'm saying some sort of joke, you know, you, you said, you absolutely assured me that you would tell me as soon as you knew what was happening, where he was going to be going. Oh, well, you know, we're always going to be going, and that was that, you just put the phone down. And then there was a good hour and a half that where, you know, nobody knew where he was, he didn't exist. And then finally we found out that they were sending him to Campsfield down in Oxfordshire. It really is not fair, but some of the people there, you know, they haven't done anything. It, it was a guy there. He lived in this country 35 years. Uh, they had the children, the grandchildren, and they were they was from Yemen. And then they were uh, they were tried to send to Jamaica. Oh, and the, and then after 29 days being there in the prison, he was released. Saying sorry, <laughs> even not saying sorry. <laughs> Because once it is, um, it got a judicial review accepted, and after that, it took. Oh, it must have been about four days before they finally decided. Okay, then the judicial review's coming, so we'll let you go home. You know, and they were saying we can keep him indefinitely. You know, you don't have to. You don't really have to have any reasons. They give you like a tick list, but the, it's, you can see they just ticked anything because the ticks had no reason to believe that he'd got any family connections. Well, yeah, it almost seems like they've kind of got down to the mentality where it's not actually people at all that they're dealing with. It's like a parcel, you know, and where has this one got to go? Is it fragile? Don't know really, we'll tick yes, you know. Does it need to be right way up? Oh, I suppose so. You know, it, they're not actually people that they're dealing with at all. But, but actually, that's what they do to refugees and asylum seekers and migrants. There's no form of judicial process. It, it, their situation is even is worse because there's no time limit. The, the, there is at least a time limit on how long they can detain so-called terrorism suspects without trial. But refugees and asylum seekers and mi other migrants can be detained for years. I mean, the longest I've heard of is three years, and commonly it's many months. And there's, so there's no due, it's done on the say-so of junior immigration officials, it's a completely arbitrary process. It's, um, they, they're supposedly entitled to bail, but it's hard, very hard to get bail and usually very big sureties are required. Terrorism suspects are not told what, why they're suspected and that's one of the horrible abuses of it. People who you know, have come here have been through real horrors in their own countries and have survived and remain sort of strong, resilient people. And it's sort of the last straw. Some of them become very badly depressed and there have been suicides, quite a lot of suicides. The guards, private guards, security guards who run these places are very badly paid, hardly trained at, at all very ignorant. They, they, they appear to believe that everybody in these places is, is illegal, which is absolutely not so. I mean, the public tends to believe that, but the people, the guards, ought to know better. Um, they, they, they make racist remarks. They say, go back where you came from, and they call them black monkeys, and, and, and they drag them out of the showers naked in front of people of a different sex. You know, they generally behave extremely badly. The government believes that if people are treated badly enough when they get to this country, uh, apparently they believe that word will get back and other people won't try to come here. It's a way of trying to keep down the numbers of asylum seekers, which of course is against all the conventions, all the inter international obligations. Wackenhut, guilty of appalling abuse of prisoners in its privatised penitentiaries in the United States, and even criticised by the Bush administration, 
were allowed into Britain to take over these operations under the name Premier Prisons. Corporations themselves freely move all around the world, rarely being subjected to such tests, interviews, case studies or scrutiny. Globalisation has seen Western corporations exploit poor countries for cheap labour, but all the while we complain when poor people come to the West to exploit worker shortages or lower birth rates. The few immigrants who are rich have made a great contribution to our country. Businessman Sir Gulam Noon, for example, built a company that now employs over a thousand people here in Britain. Companies like HSBC fire thousands of British people and open call centres in India, paying people on the cheap to increase their profits. In the next 60 seconds, HSBC will have made more money than most people would generally earn in a year. HSBC even hosted a seminar in London at which millionaires were advised how to minimise their tax payments. Let me start by saying that the UK government does not tell us officially how much tax is being lost through avoidance and evasion. Various models pred uh, estimate that it could be £100 billion a year and rising, but the Treasury papers leaked to a Sunday newspaper show that the figure is between 97 billion and 150 billion pounds each year. To put that in perspective, that is between 8 and 12 percent of the gross domestic product, or nearly twice as much money as we spend on the National Health Service each year. Okay, to give you one example, we have a very well known uh, chain of mobile phone company in the high street. For many years, its directors paid themselves in gold bars and fine wine only. Only because the way the tax legislation was at that time, the way it was worded, that you had to pay income tax and national insurance contributions on cash payments, well they argued there were no cash payments. So the directors for years and years paid themselves only in gold bars and fine wines and perfumes. And then the government changed that legislation, only needed slight tweaking, and the following week, big accountancy firms were busy devising another tax avoidance scheme. Many asylum seekers are not allowed to work legally, even though they want to. Those who claim benefits receive a smaller percentage as the rest of us, often having to live on as little as £40 a week. This leads to all kinds of desperate attempts at gaining a decent income. When 22 Chinese people found themselves unable to work legally, they took casual illegal labour picking cockles in Morecambe Bay, dangerous at the best of times, but cockle picking there said to be protected by the Magna Carta itself. The Chinese workers were paid 11 pence an hour, one pound for nine hours of work. Without a union or even proper regulations, their job became increasingly perilous, and on February the 5th, 2004, they drown. Holding many asylum seekers, Lindome Prison is in my hometown of Doncaster, another former mining town struggling to recover from the job losses in the 1980s. 
In the 1990s, its professional football club, Doncaster Rovers, were engulfed in controversy after their owner, Ken Richardson, hired a mob to burn down the stadium in an attempt to claim the insurance money. Meanwhile, Doncaster Council was embroiled in the Donnygate scandal, considered to be the worst ever case of corruption in local government. But now, with Doncaster Rovers owned by wealthy fan John Ryan, things have changed and their mayor, Martin Winter, was even democratically elected. Still, the town has been experiencing problems. The recently expanded and expensive Frenchgate shopping centre has had difficulty letting out its shops because of nearby Meadow. I knew his father, Paul Sykes' father, and uh, I used to see him back once or twice a year. And he told me that the what plans were for Meadow and all, and there's the stages that it were being built. And he said, mentioned one day, he says, he says it, it, I said, it's a lot of money. He, he didn't tell me how much, but it were millions then, like. And he said, uh, he said, ah, but these are a fall back like, he says, because it's going to be designed in a way that should it fail as a shopping mall, which it was a big gamble, nobody knew if it did work or not, um, then it's going to be a prison. With its success, though, Meadow Hall hasn't only avoided the prison system, it's damaged local businesses. Nearby Rotherham has, of course, been hit the hardest. After the coal mines closed and the steelworks didn't need them anymore, Thousands of people found themselves in sudden hardship after previously being told that they had a job for life. Well, there were two incidents. I remember one where she said, Miners, young miners, you can hang your coat, go and get your mortgages, you can get your old materialistic things, your job's is safe. Then they went and got the mortgage and everything else. And I remember at one point where they called them into the canteen and they said, Well, I'm sorry, uh, pit's closing. They are going to be made redundant, and I was telling them, I saw one young lad in his mid-twenties who stood up back wall, and I literally saw blood drain out his face, because he knew he were in trouble. But I, I do think, I do think it, it were a mistake, closing peace, but not replacing them with proper jobs. In spite of Rotherham's poverty, its people have been pulling together at events such as the Rotherham Show's Diversity Festival. Then, though, came the supposed solution to all its problems in the form of the British National Party. Standing in all three Rotherham wards for the first time, the BNP tried to offer Rotherham's final solution. They're going to flood it, which they have done. Any new housing that became available were coming to foreigners. Any idiot can come to Britain. It doesn't matter if they've got AIDS, TB, anything. Come on in, sunshine. I think it's, it's just unbelievable. They're just flooding in. With the Love Music Hate Racism shows, Rotherham showed they weren't welcome, and the BNP failed to have too much of an impact upon the town. So while they, while they, uh, people are busy voting BNP, right? They're actually making it harder for themselves to go forward and properly get on with it and proper, properly stand on front line with restorers, right? As Trojans, as uh, as we're not going to go down easy. We're going to put up a fight, and it's a spiritual fight. I'm going to keep going back to it. When you go to bed tonight, each and every one of us, if you put out your love vibes to the universe, the universe will pick them up. You hope very much the people around here don't fall for the infantile uh, rubbish of the BNP, because it is such an ancient old old uh, set of prejudices, and uh, isn't it really, you know? Mm. It's their fault, all this. Well, you know, it, 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 it's clearly rubbish, but some people do fall for it. The fascist groups and Nazi groups always follow, don't they? They always follow where there's been trauma, where there's been upheaval, where there's instability, where people are not sure because they know that they can keep pointing the finger, they can keep repeating. So, you know, somebody with a black skin is, is uh, guilty of a crime. Look, you know, they're at it again. Discount the, the fact that most of the young kids in court in Rotherham are not black at all. It's an old, old game. The arguments against foreigners entering the UK have flowed fast and furious. Avian flu was said to be brought into Britain by immigrants. 
and whenever I've gone around hospitals, sure enough I've found immigrants in there, working to save our sick. Yep, the National Health Service would be in pretty big trouble without the immigrants. But the propaganda continued, and the votes rose. I'm confident enough to believe that it'll come to nothing. They haven't got really an ideology. They've got nothing to offer local people. I don't think they've got any strategic thinking in terms of the local economy and local services because they like dressing up. They like waving flags. They like wearing leather and stuff like that. That's what they really like. They like parading about. They like having the photo taken. And they, don't they? They like being in the paper. That's what they like. And they like, a, they like the buzz of being shouted at when protected by loads of bobbies. That's what they like. After claiming Muslim men were raping white women, BNP leader Nick Griffin was taken to court on charges of inciting racial hatred. And the people were there to welcome him. Unfortunately, he had his fan club waiting for him as well. And it was clear what they regarded as their Bible. The good old white wing tabloid. Christmas banned? This was strange. When we went around various towns, Christmas seemed to be alive and well. The only thing banned was peaceful demonstration. The BNP have attempted to portray themselves as a respectable political party, and the mainstream media have often helped them with this. But many of us still know better. And our fellow persons in the community of all ethnic origins. Colleagues, when I see the magnificent specimens of the master race standing on the steps before today, and I look at the richness of our cultural diversity, I know which British nation I want to be part of. In fact, when we look closer at the BNP, we see that it is, from top to bottom, full of members linked to Nazi parties and the group Combat 1-8. One, one and eight representing the first and eighth letters of the alphabet, A and H, the initials of Adolf Hitler. And, and the nicest people I've ever met are in the BNP. Uh, in this country, the 77 July bombings have had an influence about uh, how the media portrays Muslims in general. So I don't think that's fair. That's not fair at all. Well, I think he's a complete raving lunatic. Um, he's completely bonkers. I mean, I don't know who he is. Seen pictures of him, he's a bloke with a big beard, lives in a cave somewhere. They have this problem, and they're not Muslim countries, so like, like you said, you know, they're not labelled as Christian terrorism, or is, why, why Islamic terrorism? Because Islam, the word Islam means total submission in the will of Allah. Whatever Allah wants, and what does Allah want? Allah wants his creation to live with one another with peace and harmony. They, they call themselves Muslims, and they do it, unfortunately, using the name of Islam, so they're referred to in the media as Muslim or Islamic terrorists, but it's completely wrong because Islam has got nothing to do with terrorism. Nick Griffin and his inner circle demand freedom, yet they themselves don't believe in it, certainly not freedom of religion. And this is the BNP's MO, turning and twisting things around, even hijacking the British flag itself, a flag that, arguably, stood for the defeat of fascism and a victory for freedom. Clearly, the BNP would like to undo everything Britain fought for from 1939 to 1945, when Adolf Hitler's National Socialist Party preyed upon the poverty of a people and pointed the finger at a particular race. Sounds familiar, eh? This, of course, led to the Holocaust, which the BNP deny ever happened. 
some of the greatest figures in history were refugees. But as the saying goes, there ain't no black in the Union Jack. So if the BNP had their way, Britain would have no Olympic gold medalist Kelly Holmes, no Turner Prize winner Chris Ophelia, no Olympic silver medalist Amir Khan. The achievements of those who represented our rich and diverse Great Britain would be reversed. There were hundreds of thousands of people came into this country from places like Poland, Czechoslovakia, Hungary, Ukraine, most of them forced to move by the very war itself. During the war, you weren't conscripted if you were a minor, that's true, the Bevan boys as they're known. You had huge movements of people, some of them forced to migrate by the war itself, but others brought in because the warring powers needed the labour. Uh, why are there Yemeni people in this country? The Yemeni settlement in Sheffield. Because Yemenis were the firemen on the ships in the First and Second World War. They were the people that were brought in. Why weren't they white firemen? Well, white firemen were off fighting the war in the Navy or whatever. And that's the sort of migration that they forget, conveniently forget. When I think back to our street, the myth of South Yorkshire was that it was always very insular. There was a, a solidity of white, working class, English males and their kin. If I look at our street, that wasn't the truth really in Parkgate. We were Irish, there was another Irish couple or two down the street. There was, there was at least one Polish, I think two Polish families. There was Italian families not very far. You know, there was... Um, Hungarian people, roundabout. So it was less solid white English on our street than, you know, than, than the storybooks might have us believe. What about the Punjabis? They fought for this country in the First and the Second World War. If you're fighting for a country, that country owes those people a debt. And the debt is, they come here, they're free to move. They're given British citizenship. But that's not complained of during a wartime. It's only complained of when the racists start looking at the system that's gone wrong and saying it's all the fault of the immigrants. I think people should be concerned about the BNP. Um, first of all, because they're starting to make, at some of our local elections, a real impact. Um, we had several wards in Rotherham last May where, without a lot of work, the BNP picked up six or seven hundred votes. But it's not just the potential electoral impact, that's just a signal, I think, of the underlying uh, risk of the BNP. They fan the divisions, they fan the tensions, they fan the uh, unhappiness that may be there in the communities. Um, and that's, that's their really deeply corrupting and deeply divisive impact. That's why we should be concerned. Well, I think they're afraid of us and I think we are a party that speaks the truth. Um, we are getting afraid of immigration. People are flooding into the country. Uh, they've made this mistake and they, they want to deny it. So they try to throw uh, all manner of things on tours. Uh, I don't hate anybody, we're not racist. What we're saying is it's a tiny island and people can't keep flooding in. What would you say to people that would claim that the BNP have uh, preyed on people's concerns and have been perceived as a party that deals with those concerns, whereas in mainstream politics there isn't a party that deals with the working class anymore? Well, I would, I would first, first of all, uh, I don't think that's true, you know, and I would argue very strongly that uh, still at the heart of the values of the Labour Party and at the heart of most of the policies that we've been trying to pursue, particularly in the last 10 years in government, certainly also on the council, are a concern first and foremost for opportunities and provision for those that have the least. Do you think there's a, I know a majority of asylum seekers at the moment are coming from Afghanistan and Iraq, do you think that's a coincidence that we were involved, you know, that we bombed those countries recently and now there's a, a lot of people coming from from those countries to, to Britain. Well, in fact, we got a lot of asylum seekers um, from Iraq when Saddam Hussein was, was in power. Mm -hmm. We got a lot of, uh, probably more asylum seekers from Afghanistan when the Taliban 
mm-hmm. were, were in charge there. The overwhelming majority of asylum seekers about which all the fuss is made in the last few years has been from countries invaded from the West, from Somalia, Afghanistan, Kosovo and especially Iraq. Conflicts from all around the world have created refugees. Our government has hardly helped the people in these places and have in some cases exacerbated the situation. In fact, the only two areas that held our interest were the resource-rich countries of Afghanistan and Iraq, which we actually bombed into the Dark Ages. The figures show the world had almost 10 million refugees in 2006. The increase is largely because of the Iraq crisis, which has forced up to one and a half million people to seek safety in other countries. The Sudanese make up the largest African refugee group, with more than 680,000 fleeing to other states, mainly due to the conflict in Darfur. But the two million Afghans living in other countries remain the largest group of refugees in 2006. Yeah, I was just going to say I don't particularly want to do a long interview about Iraq. With the government's attacks on those countries, racism seems to have been buoyed by those in power with the state's own reactionary decisions supporting the stereotypes and demonization of Muslims, as opposed to peacefully looking at the reasons why there is conflict and terrorism and hatred. With these divisions created, Yorkshire Asians, misguided by extremists in response to these unjust wars, committed the terrible attacks in London on July the 7th, 2005. In the weeks following, racial violence in the Yorkshire area doubled, whites against blacks. But all across the country, the effects were felt, with race hate crime rising 29% in just 12 months, and in 67% of religion cases, the victim was Muslim. Many of us now know about Stephen Lawrence, stabbed to death by a white gang whilst waiting for a London bus. But then there's Kalan Kawa Karim, an activist who opposed Saddam Hussein's regime, murdered in Wales. In Scotland, Chris Donald was knifed, then set on fire. Peman Bamani stood up to racist and was stabbed to death. The police felt the inconvenience of CCTV when nightclub cameras caught them using excessive force against black girl Tony Coma. Then though, the cycle was finally taken to its logical conclusion, when Brazilian-born electrician Jean-Charles de Menezes, working to save money in the hopes of one day opening a farm, was followed by police officers, wrongfully suspected of being a terrorist. When they tried to apprehend him, the Brazilian, particularly afraid because his visa was already up for renewal, tried to escape, only to be pumped full of bullets, shot seven times in the head and chest. Instead of the police officers being tried for murder or even manslaughter, the Metropolitan Police merely faced fines for breaking health and safety laws. Black youth Anthony Walker was killed with an axe in Liverpool by Michael Barton. Meanwhile, former Sheffield Wednesday player Paolo Di Canio confessed to being a fascist, giving the Nazi salute on the field. Nonetheless, sport has united many people in Britain. But if the BNP got into power, England would be without many of its top stars. The BNP actually supported Denmark as they beat England three goals to nothing simply because the Danes had an all-white team. England coach Sven Joran Eriksson was once a welcome saviour to England, even though from Sweden. Yet The Sun, Britain's most popular tabloid newspaper, finally turned against him, visiting FA officers to give him his P45. He resigned shortly after. Influential television personalities show their attitudes to blacks and Asians are equally offensive, with Ron Atkinson's comments about Chelsea player Marcel Desailly being a <laughs> then, just after the deaths of the Chinese cockle pickers in Morecambe Bay, attracting more criticism for saying Wendy Deng is Chinese. Ironically, she's also the wife of media mogul Rupert Murdoch, head of News Corporation, which owns the Sun newspaper as well as Sky TV. Rupert Murdoch's fellow tycoon Conrad Black was so determined to accept a peerage from Britain 
to be given the title of Lord that he gave up his Canadian citizenship in the year 2000 in order to be able to do so. However, he was then found guilty of fraud after allegedly stealing almost £30 million from investors. Who do these guys think they are? Like Lord Black, also an immigrant, Rupert Murdoch isn't just rich, he's filthy rich. So you'd think that, given the billions we've made him since he arrived from Australia, he'd be grateful enough to give a little something back, in taxes maybe. Now this, what is being avoided, is through everything, whether it is VAT, national insurance contributions, customs and excise duties, income tax, corporation tax, inheritance tax, those who can are avoiding it. Another example is that companies who operate in the UK, for example, the, the Sun newspaper, the Times, the Sunday Times, News of the World, Sky, are common names, well-known brands in Britain. They make their money in UK, but a lot of their income, and the law permits this, is booked in offshore tax havens, so the profits are booked in a place entirely different from where the economic activity is, and as a result, uh, these companies pay a little in corporation taxes. So if you look at News Corp, which is uh, associated with Rupert Murdoch, it pays very little corporation tax in the UK. And the shame is that all this is permitted by law. Meanwhile, Murdoch's corporation encourages children's parents to buy textbooks by collecting tokens from its newspapers. These working class people, some amongst the poorest fifth, who pay almost 10% of their income on direct taxes, and 28% in indirect taxes, with Britain the hardest working country in the developed world, with a quarter of the workforce working 48 hours a week. It can easily be dealt with. The government can change law. In 1994, Gordon Brown said, when he was in opposition, uh, then the Chancellor in opposition, that the incoming Labour government would change laws and tackle these uh, loopholes but nothing whatsoever has been done. And it is very, very simple to deal with. All you say is we will tax companies in the places where the economic activity takes place, not where they choose to book. So I'll give you another example. Uh, Daily Express, Sunday Express is a well-known newspaper. Now, these uh, newspapers operate in the UK, but they are owned by an entity registered in the island of Jersey and the head office in the island of Jersey is one room above an Indian restaurant in St. Helier. That is where the board of directors meet. That is where some of the records are maintained. And as a result, the Express Empire pays very little in UK corporation taxes. Again, I want to emphasize they are not doing anything unlawful. It is the stupidity of our legal system which permits them to do this most other countries do not permit this. Even the Isle of Man will tax you on the basis of economic activity. And the Isle of Man itself is a tax haven. So Britain is a place where uh, we now have reverse socialism in operation, where the poor are funding the rich. But Rupert Murdoch's media conveniently and constantly tell us to point the finger at the asylum seekers entering the country. These people seeking asylum from war, tyranny and torture who are lucky to claim £40 a week in benefits and live in bedsits while this rich immigrant avoids tax and buys more mansions. And then gets us looking the other way with his right-wing editors, telling us to blame the destitute asylum seekers for supposedly getting free phones. Wow. This, this is a case for saying that the sun is not journalism. If you look at the, the sun any day, it's largely defined by four things propaganda, public relations, pornography, and sport on the back pages. And the only place you could actually say is journalism in those four kind of forms of content is the sport. The rest of it is exactly what journalism should not be. The links between Rupert Murdoch and, and, and New Labour are, are very interesting. Um, there are first of all, certain ideological links. They share certain common viewpoints. Um, certainly the idea of managed migration is one of them. Um, New Labour and Rupert Murdoch share the idea that migration, inward migration, into the UK 
should be decided by economic utility. So migrants who should be accepted, who should be allowed in, are migrants who can make a contribution to the capitalist economy. They are the good people, they are the good migrants. And that doesn't necessarily mean highly educated people because the economy needs its fruit pickers just as much as it needs its doctors, mm -hmm. by their view. What that of course means is that certain groups who are perceived and therefore constructed as being um, non-economically uh, productive, that is asylum seekers, um, are, should be kept out. London's mayor, Ken Livingstone, was attacked for his comments against the Jewish reporter for the Evening Standard, but they are owned by Associated Newspapers Limited, who also publish the Daily Mail. The Mail is second only to the Sun in popularity, and its views on immigration may be even more extreme. Yes, in the 1930s, I'm, I'm not sure if there were any institutional links between Robert Mayer and possibly Mosley and the New Party, and as much as I wasn't sure whether he's, he was a member of the party, whether he'd ever met Rosalie or whatever, but certainly Rosalie gave put the weight of his newspapers, and it wasn't just the mail, he also owned the Daily Mirror at that time, behind the black shirts. So there's quite a famous article in, I think it was in the Mirror, which headlined, Hurrah for the Black Shirts, and there were similar articles published in the Daily Mail at that time, penned by himself as kind of um, editorial pieces supporting the black shirts, supporting what they were doing, both in terms of their, um, their policies, their politics, you know, fascism, but also specifically in relation to their anti-Semitism. So what was interesting at this time, and it's really quite illuminating looking back now because you see echoes to what's going on at the moment in relation to the demonization of Muslims, because a lot of the, um, the anti-Semitism of reporting at this time was in relation to the violence in Palestine, specifically in relation to what you know, the Stern Gang and other militant Zionist organizations were doing over there, attacking the British army, blowing up hotels, things like that. So a major um, strand, if you like, justifying the anti-Semitism of newspapers at this time was that Jews in this country need to distance themselves from terrorism being done in their name in Palestine. And it's a really quite a striking um, parallel to what's going on now, ironically, somewhat, in Daily Mail, amongst other newspapers, constantly requiring Muslims to denounce you know, actions of others supposedly done in the name of, of Islam. It's, it's quite a striking parallel. While we were filming in London, we decided to look into the earnings of the politicians. Barbara Follett, married to best-selling author Ken Follett, who is worth £15 million, claims allowance for her Soho flat, whilst the likes of Jenny Tong and Barry Gardiner also claim for London homes even when they had a home there anyway. MPs earn, including expenses, over £100,000 a year each, paid for by us. Ten years ago, MPs decided to give themselves a pay rise of 26% when inflation was only 3% and around 5 years ago they gave themselves only 7% when inflation was 2%. Labour's Whitehall advisers cost over £2 billion. Funny how people aren't told about these things, instead encouraged to oppose immigration. Well, immigrants boost the British economy in a number of ways. First of all, uh, they do jobs that British people, not enough British people can do, things like foreign nurses in the NHS. Uh, secondly, they do uh, jobs that British people uh, no longer want to do. And the best example is probably working in uh, retirement homes. Uh, you ask any, um, anyone who runs a retirement home, they put job ads, um, and uh, they get no responses from British people, apart from a few people who are unsuitable. If it wasn't for, for, if it wasn't for foreigners, then um, uh, our old people wouldn't be looked after. Uh, and thirdly, um, uh, they contribute to society because um, their diversity many people find enjoyable, but also uh, it's good for um, economic growth because um, it boosts innovation. You just have to look at how many um, small companies are set up by um, uh, immigrants. You just have to look at how many 21 of Britain's Nobel Prize winners are started off as refugees, people who, you know, if you ask the um, anti-immigrant pit lot would say, oh well, these people are just scrounging off society. Actually, they're among the, the biggest contributors to British society. Britain, the fourth richest nation on the planet, 
ranks 74th in the world for number of refugees it takes in. 0.05% of all the world's refugees, yet the country's media coverage of asylum seekers seems to be way ahead of any other. George W. Bush talks about extending his American brand of freedom into the darkest corners of the world, and yet regimes are only overthrown if in opposition to his government's ideology, regardless of how they treat their people. The Home Office condemned Robert Mugabe's regime in Zimbabwe as an appalling abuser of human rights, yet expected asylum seekers to return there, causing many to go on hunger strike. Great Britain is supposed to have long been a flag bearer of human rights, an attractive example to all other races, yet we turn around and deny others these rights even when we have supported the country's regimes from which they fled. No Borders in Sheffield started about two years ago as part of a national organisation of No Borders groups. Uh, a number of us got together for different reasons. Um, one of them was that we realised it was about 100 years since the first immigration controls in Britain and we thought it was significant to, to mark that moment uh, and to make the point that immigration controls weren't natural, hadn't always been there yet. Back at Lindholm Prison, some concerned citizens who have seen through the smoke screen have been demonstrating too. We're, um, I mean, the, the main point of the demo was to actually try and communicate with people inside, make a lot of noise, get things high on the fence. Hopefully, people will actually see that we're here because the, a lot of people come straight through um, customs, get picked up at customs, put in a group four van, take them to a detention centre, and that's all they see. And there's a lot of psychological pressure that they're not welcome here um, to get people to take voluntary deportation without even going through proper legal processes. Um, when I first found out about the, the <laughs> detention estate, I think the, the government call it, uh, they, about 11,000 people pass through, um, um, no, no prosecution, no trial, pass through detention. A lot of them then end up getting deported. Um, and people just don't know about it. There's, there are centres like this dotted all over the country. There's one at Gatwick, there's one at Heathrow, there's one on the south coast at Haslar, Harmonsworth, um, and... Um, there's one at Waterloo, they've got holding cells, they hold people in police stations, they use wings of prisons, they hold people in, in normal prisons with, um, with like other prison inmates. They, um, yeah, it's everywhere basically and there's bound to be one near you if you want to get involved. They've even been throwing notes of support over the tall walls of the compound intended for the asylum seekers detained inside. The company Wackenhut has the contract for transporting imprisoned asylum seekers and for security at ports and airports. Nearer to the town centre is Doncaster Prison itself, nicknamed Doncatras because it's surrounded by water. It was run by none other than Wackenhut. The company itself was formed by George Wackenhut, a former FBI agent who, even after the era of McCarthyism had ended, made his fortune by gathering information on civil rights campaigners and anti-war protesters and selling it to pretty much anyone with enough money to buy. He was so right-wing that he once referred to George Bush Sr. as pink, which gives us some kind of idea of just how far right-wing Wackenhut is. Meanwhile, Wackenhut's privatised prisons in the United States were condemned when they were found to be home to some appalling violations, including physical and sexual abuse of prisoners. Nonetheless, in 2005, Paul Boating MP renewed Wackenhut's contract for Doncaster Prison. That same year, Serco, described as probably the biggest company you've never heard of, bought out Wackenhut's control of Doncatras. Serco have made a lot of money from New Labour's obsession with Thatcherite privatisation. Their own website describes the company as working with governments to reduce crime and re-offending, control immigration and prevent terrorism. Well, of course, you know, the, the infamous example of, of, of this situation is the case of Zahid Mubarak, who, um, as a, a young, vulnerable man, uh, an Asian guy on remand, was locked up with uh, a very dangerous, quite possibly psychopathic uh, uh, 
racist, um, who had racist tattoos and was, was quite obviously going to be a threat to Zahid. Um, and they were, they, were, they were locked up together and, and Zahid was murdered. Um, and you know the question is, should um, should the prison service and ultimately the government um, have a legal responsibility to ensure uh, a, a safe system for people like him? And where things go wrong, should there be a positive obligation to uh, to investigate and make sure that things don't happen again? You know, a lot of rubbish is talked about the Human Rights Act. If we didn't have a human rights act in this country, there would have been no positive obligation to investigate. The government resisted a full uh, investigation, a full public inquiry, and it was only through using the Human Rights Act that Zahid's family uh, and supporters ultimately got uh, the inquiry and, and the justice that, uh, that he deserves. But their plight doesn't get votes, so nobody in power particularly cares and the overcrowding with a prison population at an all-time high of over 80,000 may have something to do with the fact that the new Labour government created thousands of laws whilst in power, about one for every day spent in office, including brand new anti-terror laws, obstructing an inspection by the Adult Learning Inspectorate, importing Polish potatoes, and, last but not least, making it illegal to create a nuclear explosion. The prisons are full, and people are losing the plot, and not just in Doncatraz. Leaked internal official reports revealed that more than 160 prison officers were implicated in allegations of torture of inmates at Wormwood Scrubs Prison that had come to light in the late 1990s. But perhaps more tragically is the fact that in Britain, children as young as 10 years old are being imprisoned. British age of criminal responsibility is lower than in countries such as Germany, Canada, and Russia. The Chief Inspectorate of Prisons believed a large amount of prisoners should not even be inside. But the privatised prison sector means prisons are paid per prisoner, meaning the more prisoners, the more profit. Prisons are good for business, and therefore so are illegal immigrants and criminals themselves. The more laws passed restricting civil liberties, the more profit. The more illegal drugs there are, the more profit. The more people put in prison, the more profit. And so propaganda, fear, and above all the political act of putting crime and immigration at the top of the election agenda is crucial for those with money and power. Hmm, are you thinking what I'm thinking? What do Doncaster's own politicians think of Doncatraz? Well, many of them through the years have been criminals themselves. Doncaster's mayor, Martin Winter, is the second highest paid mayor outside of London, and in spite of Donnygate being history, he was recently caught spending taxpayers' money on acting lessons with RADA so he could deliver speeches more convincingly. How much of it all is an act? How much of it all is fictitious? What is it that the politicians and their spin have told us to do? It seems they've had us pointing the finger at our neighbours, black and white, male and female, using the working classes like pawns in a game, pitting us against each other while they take more money for themselves and leave us in poverty where entities like the BNP move in and try to exploit our desperation and our fear. Sometimes the threat isn't even real. There was supposedly a plot to attack our country using the deadly poison ricin. What they forgot to clarify later was the fact that no ricin was ever found in the flat they were talking about, just a few ingredients that might be used to manufacture it. Remember the attempted attack on Manchester United's home, Old Trafford? The Sun newspaper told us that the supposed terrorists planned to ominously sit at different parts of the stadium. Well, that was because they couldn't get tickets to sit together. Their home was filled with Manchester United paraphernalia because it was a symbol of the country they had come to love. But none of this was cleared up, and the ethnic minorities at the centre of the case were released without charge, with no apology from the police or the press, even though they lost their homes and their jobs due to the allegations. There was the storming of a house in Forest Gate, where police shot one of two Asian men, but no explosives were found in their home as a result of the raid. And while we were all busy looking for a dark-skinned man with a backpack, two BNP members were taken to court for stockpiling chemical weapons and bomb-making equipment, but the media didn't seem too interested. They were busy reporting on all the terror threats at airports. Airports have become scareports, and the word terminal has taken on another meaning. 
fear has allowed us to accept long lines and searches without wondering why Switzerland or France aren't under threat the same way we are. If the terrorists hate freedom, then surely they'd be attacking those countries as well. After the bombings in Madrid, the Spanish elected a socialist government who pulled their troops from Iraq, and the terror there simply stopped. Experts and top prosecutors warned the British government that its foreign policy had fueled religious extremism and terrorism, but they still dismissed such reports and continued the occupation. With Western policy in the Middle East leading to the terrorist attacks of July 7, 2005, the government used this as an excuse to introduce all kinds of draconian laws in the name of the never-ending War on Terror. The result? Whilst Nick Griffin escapes prison, the rest of us all become potential terrorists. And um, as part of my work, I'm involved in actions whereby um, we do things on the street to raise awareness. Um, there was an action which I agreed to take part in called 100,000 Bells for Iraq, and it was to remember all of the people who had died in the war against Iraq, both um, Iraqis and British soldiers. And as part of the action, we were reading out a name. We were reading out the names of 100,000 Iraqis and at the time 97 British soldiers who had ki been killed as a direct result of the war. On the morning of my arrest we met near Trafalgar Square and uh, we made our way down Whitehall and Mill was a little way ahead of me he came back and said I've just spoken to some police officers and they've said it's zero tolerance if we go and protest we're going to be arrested and at that moment I was having second thoughts about um, taking part in the protest but then I thought being arrested is nothing compared to having your home and your way of life and your family destroyed. And I felt really passionately about marking these people's deaths and protesting um, against the invasion of Iraq and the death of 100,000 people. And um, I'd already made the decision beforehand when I was walking up Whitehall that I would continue my protest no matter what. So um, I stood firm and continued to protest and about 20 minutes later I was arrested and taken to Charing Cross Police Station. We refused to give our dates of births in court, which isn't a legal requirement within this country. And um, the reason why we refused to give our dates of birth was because um, we were making a stand that we were not answerable to the state. We're not, we weren't proven guilty at that particular time, yet we were being demanded to give personal information about ourselves by the state. And when we refused to give information, we were held in contempt of court and um, I was held in a prison cell. Uh, so it was 2003, September, um, and Dicey, which is uh, a big arms fair that happens every two years in London, it's the world's biggest arms fair, has come into London um, and exhibiting at the Excel Centre uh, in Docklands. And there was a lot of protests around that, a lot of peaceful protests, and so I was going along to take part in a peaceful protest. And I was trying to find the place, trying to find the protest and cycling around the area. And there were loads of police around, um, on every single street corner there were dozens of police. And so I was passing some police and somebody phoned me, I took a phone call. And as I got back on my bike, um, I got stopped and the police just said to me, we want to kind of go through your stuff. 
Uh, and so obviously I said, why, what's, well, what's going on here? Um, and what powers are you using? Because I'd spoken to, spoken to people, protesters before about stop and search, and they always say, make sure you find out what powers they're using. So I said, under what power are you stopping me? And they said, uh, well, we're going to use a terrorism act, which means we can stop you uh, and search you without any kind of suspicion that you're a terrorist. I've been raided uh, twice now, sort of thing, uh, for various uh, sort of alleged offences that have taken place. Right, and that's more to target you as an activist? Yeah, that sort of, uh, one was specific and one was really more of a fishing trip. They obviously sort of wanted to see what, what I had in my house, sort of thing. They could have a look round, they come in, they sort of disrupt your house, they intimidate your partner or anybody who's in there with you. This is generally unpleasant, really. The Blair years are years of tragic irony, I think, when it comes to rights and freedoms. On the one hand, this is the government that gave us the Human Rights Act. They possibly, without any great enthusiasm, and possibly it wouldn't, wouldn't have done it if it knew what it was doing or if it was left to its second term. So we have the 1998 Human Rights Act, thanks to Mr Blair and his government. This is also the government that has sought to dismantle the presumption of innocence, which has long been at the heart of English justice and is in fact a principle of justice that was exported from this country to democracies all over the world. This is a government that has clamped down on freedom of expression and uh, and the right to protest and it is you know it is the oxygen of democracy and it's been clamped down on for no justification by 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 this government in the in the serious organized crime act we've seen uh, detention without trial for three and a half years in Belmarsh prison foreign nationals suspected of links with international terrorism They've never had charges, evidence or proof they were locked up. You could be arrested under suspicion of terrorism, not charged with anything, locked up for 28 days, and the government wanted it to be 90 days, three months, the equivalent of a six-month custodial sentence. This is in Britain, the oldest democracy in the world. What signal does that send to the rest of the world? But there are other changes that have affected the lives of many, many more people. And a great example of that, I think, um, it is the attack on personal privacy. You know, if we don't give up a little privacy, we can't we ha can't have a conversation, we can't work with each other, we can't have criminal investigations. But if you have no respect for privacy, you build a society with no intimacy, no dignity, and no trust. And that is a road that we've gone far too uh, far down. We are now living in a surveillance society. More CCTV cameras uh, per head than anywhere else, um, where we're, we're now heading for compulsory identity cards. They just compromise our personal privacy, they change the relationship between the individual and the state, and they're very dangerous to race relations. So we're heading for this very expensive compulsory identity card scheme with no obvious benefits. And we see the rise of all sorts of massive databases, bigger than necessary, uh, not properly protected, uh, with this terrible slogan, nothing to hide, nothing to fear. A national DNA database that holds the DNA of people who've never even been charged, let alone convicted, of a criminal offence. So a database of people who've just rubbed shoulders with the police, they've had an encounter with the police at some stage, they may have been let go immediately, um, no further questions, sorry, you're the wrong person. Their DNA can now be held forever by the police. The government denies these laws are fascist, and we'd better hope they never are, because with this kind of information, a fascist government would never need the help of IBM computers to exterminate certain kinds of people, like in World War II. All the details on us are right there, ready and waiting. Yep, in response to terrorism that's largely been buoyed by Western foreign policy, those same states have started to use a sledgehammer to crack a peanut. Tony Blair pushed anti-terror laws whilst George W. Bush championed the ironically named Patriot Act and had his own citizens wiretapped, all in the name of fighting religious extremists. Whilst Al-Qaeda supposedly struck in the name of Allah, George Bush said God told him to attack Iraq. With such conversations as that going on, between the supposed leader of the free world and God Almighty, the White House phone might make far more interesting listening were it to be wiretapped. No wonder the president knew who the religious extremists were. After all, God told him. But the policies continued, 
and Big Brother was watching us while we were busy watching Big Brother. Yeah, while the bombs were being dropped in the Middle East and the terrorists were attacking in retaliation, the only real winners were the rich and powerful, and the only losers were us. Well, the British people were starting to lose patience. At the Labour Party conference, the GMEX became a prison for those responsible for it all. With a ring of steel created to protect the politicians within, tens of thousands of people protested outside. Soon after, Tony Blair announced his decision to finally step down as Prime Minister. Maybe he even move to Mallorca. It's a long road I've traveled. It's a long road I've traveled. When the elections, you know, were up and running, and um, the the election term before President Bush, he was only elected because Ohio was a bit of a swing state, and they had problems with the actual ballots in some county in Ohio. And then again, when I was in D.C., in where my parents live, in the particular Pembroke Pines County, they had a problem with the ballots as well, which. I mean, two two terms in a row. You have problems with counting of the ballots. Seems a bit dodgy and you know, and a bit wishy-washy in my perspective. My brother and sister went to Florida to visit my dad. He was staying there for about six months. He was doing some stuff. Uh, this is about a year after September 11th. Every shop down that street where um, where they lived had signs in the windows. Um, no Muslims allowed in this store. No Muslims, no Arabs allowed, no blah blah blah, all the way along. Even in the airport on the way home, um, because of our name, it's Musmari, one of the one of the people at the desk said, uh, where, where does your name originate from? And he said, what's it matter? I've got a British passport. And he's, he said, no, but where does your name originate? He said, Libya, why is that a problem? He said, yes, sir, we'd like to take you and took him away and questioned him for two hours and my sister. So I may have to go back to Britain at some point. So I would hope, if that's the case, that things will have improved. But I really can't think how they can improve at this stage. I think everything is becoming very polarised. There was still a lot left to do back in Britain. I think so. We always need to be optimistic. Change happens. That's just an inevitability. You know, the world does change. Um, divorcing yourself from that process is a surefire way to make sure that it doesn't change in a way you want it to change. But it will change. And so that means these great values that are both universal and British, equal treatment, dignity, fairness, um, we've got to live them as well as spout them. And I think when we do, when the politicians do, they will see a resurgence in uh, direct connection with democratic politics. Because, because I don't think people are any less political today than ever they were. They're just less part of political. I'm a great believer in the strength of demonstrations, and public demonstrations, coming out publicly and demonstrating. They, I mean, the other thing that people do do, which is a very valuable thing to do, is go and visit people inside these places. I mean, it's one way of educating oneself. Uh, governments can't stop people moving across borders. The government here you know, likes to pretend that, uh, that, that it can, but it can't. Um, I think that awareness um, about these new pieces of legislation has really been raised um, in the last year, couple of years, and I think it's such that they realise that public opinion um, won't allow them to continue passing these pieces of legislation. I mean, I think the, the, the biggest hope was um, when people broke away from apathy when they heard we were, uh, when Blair and Bush were planning to go into Iraq, and, and, and the mobilisation of two million people is just unprecedented.
Back in Westminster, I remained in the centre of power, and coincidentally, here in Westminster all unauthorised protest has been banned within a half mile. This law was introduced, apparently, to deal with one agitator in particular, Brian Hall, who maintained a protest in Parliament Square from 2001. After the government was unable to move him, the House of Commons Procedure Committee held an inquiry at which evidence was put forward claiming such demonstrations could be used to disguise terrorists. And so, all protests in the area without prior permission were banned. And yet, due to a loophole, Brian Hall remains. This means that though the government claimed to want to stop one man and not peaceful protesters, in fact, everyone else is banned, while some loon remains. He shall not be moved. So in order to protest, you have to first ask permission from those you're protesting against. As I stood there feeling frightened for our future and losing hope, I saw the statue of Winston Churchill and imagined him rolling over in his grave at the erosion of civil liberties and reversal of ancient British laws that made our country great. I wondered what he might believe we should do when our government introduces such statutes, when the perimeters are withdrawn, when the lines are drawn back so far that we have no choice but to find ourselves crossing over them. And, well, I decided to protest anyway. What the authorities didn't realise was, due to the wonders of art, we were still able to get our point across. Riding on a bus, bus, no one makes the making fuss, ringtone, youth alarm, battery churn, chat farm, climate change, power down, hunts and foxes, bloodhounds, scan them in and buy coat, let them stop when the low look out, kids, it's how it is, better look for a new way, I'll turn your eyes the other way, man in a green suit, hunt you down the army roof, hey there, don't shoot, but he's just We live in a democracy where you can see this film, but watch your back as you sit in the cinema. After all, what you're seeing on screen is illegal. Great Britain is still a tiny island, and in ancient times it was the most invaded land on the planet. The Celts, the Romans, the Anglo-Saxons from Germany, the Vikings from Scandinavia, and the Normans from France all invaded and became part of our nation. So, what does it mean to be British? It can't be about being one race, because we simply aren't one race. So is it instead about our achievements and our values? But what are they? The Dark Ages saw the introduction of dungeons as retribution towards those who committed crimes. 
today we are told that prisons serve as a form of rehabilitation. But how many people were put there due to draconian anti-terror laws? How many people who committed crimes did so due to social conditions such as poverty? How many people committed crimes of passion? But above all, how effective are prisons themselves at turning bad people into good people? And what really happens to these people while in the hands of corporations with their own agendas ruled by profit and loss columns? The concept of a prison is to remove a human being's basic desire, freedom. But how far must the perimeter be withdrawn? With a prison? With a country's border? With the dropping of a bomb? With erosion of our civil liberties in freedom's name? Or perhaps even with a lack of true information, leading us to blame those poorer than ourselves and kick the dog as the fat cats laugh? That said, could it be stated that we have all become prisoners? And with that said, surely it's time we all joined together and escaped. This is a British Nasty Party announcement. We have taken control of the fight against the alien invasion. Follow our manifesto. Stamp them with a number. Lock yourself in to keep them out. Build a prison inside your mind. Change the law. Become a lager out. Support what we say is English. And if you don't, watch out. And when you have no freedom or rights, you'll know 